in lockdown, if you do it pretty much every day for two weeks, you're going to have a hell of a time stopping it when the lockdown's over, including bad food habits, TV watching habits, yelling at your children habits, whatever it might be. There are people that have been doing stuff on lockdown that they don't want as habits, but they're going to have them. And so one question I think everybody should be asking before they do something, for example, as you said, before they eat some cake, they should be asking themselves, do I want to be a cake eater at the end of this? So what do I want to use the lockdown for? Boot camp. I want to use lockdown as boot camp for what's next. And too many people are using lockdown as summer camp. We stand today. The Business Method with the Shadow. The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneur's systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and welcome to the Business Method Podcast, a podcast featuring successful entrepreneurs and high-profile people dissecting their business models. We dissect the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. On our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that have built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that produce over a million dollars and annual revenue and now we're interviewing 100 major influencers to get behind the minds and the science of using influence to grow business and influence income results economies and cultures there's a growing number of people building these caliber of businesses like this and we're going to figure out what it takes to make this happen now let's jump in today's show the business method hey guys real quick a word from our sponsors NomadX.com is shaping the way remote workers live, work, and learn online at NomadX.com. Remote workers can find apartments, bedrooms, or co-living spaces to rent on a monthly basis, 50% more affordable than Airbnb. True story, you guys. Plus, that's not all. NomadX is a comprehensive educational platform providing easy-to-learn courses to start or to scale your successful location-independent online business. They have built an incredible community with more than 7,000 remote workers and online entrepreneurs, and they have over 21,000 followers on Instagram to show you how to position yourself as an authority and how to combine different social media channels to gain maximum visibility. During these remote working times, NomadX.com is the trusted community for location-independent entrepreneurs to live, work, and learn online. Check them out at NomadX.com. That's NomadX.com. And now, let's hop in to today's podcast. Entrepreneur's systems, methods, tools, and tactics. And listeners, welcome to the podcast today. I'm really excited to welcome today's guest, Eric Mendez. One of the reasons I'm excited to welcome him is because I have seen him everywhere on my YouTube feed. His commercials are blowing up all over the place. He's the founder of Wild Fit, and uh, it's a really cool perspective on diets and the way to look at, excuse me, I think diets is a bad word, but eating and consuming food and the importance of how we consume food today. And Eric has a fantastic story to share and has created a considerable amount of success and results for people through his business and through his his plan. So first off, I want to say welcome to the show, Eric. Eric, how are you today? Good, good. Thanks very much for having me. And you're in the Dominican right now, right? I am. I'm in Cabarete on Kite Beach in the Dominican Republic. Not a bad place to be as far as lockdowns go. Is that your, your home base then? You know, I really live in Turks and Caicos, but I spend a huge amount of of my time here at this place. I I enjoy it here a lot. We keep a home here and I'm into kiteboarding and, you know, the conditions are good. Why do you spread your time out between those two places? I, you know, I just, it's one of those years ago, I recognized you didn't have to live where you were born, you know, And, and so I just, I tend to spend time where I want to be. And so I've lived in, I think, five countries now and I've visited 60 and um, I, you know, we, we first relocated to Turks and Caicos about 12 years ago. And then one day came here for a visit and was like, you know, we quite like it here. And so this is our sort of home away from home. And, and I, in the end, I just end up spending more time here. It's, it's, uh, it's a nice lifestyle. It's a good way to live, man. Um, I'd like to, before we dive into the meat and potatoes of the podcast, I might ask you this about how you create your lifestyle. I've been a location independent entrepreneur for nine years, two days ago. And I've uh, been traveling the world and usually go 
in between three to six months in a location and, and have my regular places. Like I like Europe in the summer, uh, Asia in the fall, and then springtime usually in the Americas. So what are some little things that, um, and we have a lot of lifestyle entrepreneurs, location independent entrepreneurs that listen as well. So, so what are some little things that you add to your lifestyle and, and the bases that you choose to make it like just really juicy to make it a good place to be? You know, one of them I don't think you'll be expecting, but was overcoming the rubbish I had about public speaking. Uh, you know, what what really transformed my life a great deal was I was so terrified. I mean, I mean, I'm talking terrified of public speaking, and I overcame it. And um, I was, you know, I sold my first business. I guess it must be 15 years ago, and that's when I kind of made that jump to I'm going to work and live where I want to be. And I just started traveling. I bought my first ever round the world plane ticket. And I uh, just started traveling around the world. I bought five more of them over the next three years. And, but during that time, I started speaking. And I'd get invited. I remember one day I was in London. I got invited to do this talk. I happened to be based out of London at the time. And I, I did this talk. And somebody at that talk came up to me and said, would you come speak in Singapore in a week? And I'm like, sure. And I went off to Singapore. And then at that talk, somebody said, can you do a tour of Australia and New Zealand? And I said, sure. And, and one of the things that it did, quite aside from the fact that it can drive great income and all that kind of stuff, because that's sort of what it wasn't even on my mind at that stage. What really, what it really did for me is that it is a um, nuclear fast way to speed up networking. It, it really is because you show up at an event, you speak, if you make them laugh, if you make them cry, if you make them think, if you give them a value, if you take them out of pain, um, they, it, it, you know, you just you've just hyper sped up your whole networking experience. And so to this day, uh, I don't, it doesn't matter if I'm in Cape Town, Joburg, London, Birmingham, uh, uh, Los Angeles, Austin, it doesn't really matter where I go. I can instantly put a network together when I get there because I've, I, that's my best ever lifestyle travel hack. I got to say, I hadn't thought about it till you asked the question. <laughs> that's huge though. That's a really good point. I travel. I, I kind of do the same. Like I travel for purpose. Like there's gotta be a conference there and then I get to see the, the fun things on the side, stay a little bit longer because I do have that flexibility. And I find like, if I go to a place without a purpose, it's just not not as fulfilling anymore. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you, you mentioned something. So I'm curious in your presentations, you mentioned make people laugh, make people cry, make their pain go away. So are those three things that you aim for when you do speak? Because I've seen some of your videos. You're a good speaker now. You're a great speaker, actually. I've seen your Mind Valley videos and then a bunch of your YouTube videos, of course. And I was watching some more on your website before the call. So is that is that uh, key points that you try to hit during your presentations? Yeah, you know, I um, at Speaker Nation we um, we teach online presentation skills and on and an audience presentation skills, and um, we have a system that we use that we developed years ago, and we call it PPMs, and so it's peaks per minute, and so when you're putting a talk together, what you want to do is make sure that you are generating peak experiences for people, and what what does that mean? Well, it means laugh or cry, right? Or what it really means is feel really good or feel really bad. And, and that may sound a little odd to say you want to make people feel bad, but sometimes in order to teach a lesson, you need to tell a story that, it, that, that creates pain for them. And that's, that's, a, you know, that's a classic part of telling a really good story. So there's the ups and downs, but then there's also uh, ahas, you know, where you've delivered something that fills a curiosity gap that existed in their psyche and they suddenly go, oh. I never thought of that before or there, you know, and, and so those are all peak moments that I think that you're trying to put together when you put a talk together, you're either trying to make them feel at one, like everybody just lives in this boredom zone and pretty much everything they do is to get out of the boredom zone. They watch Netflix to get out of the boredom zone. Only it just puts them back in. They eat junk food to put, take them out of the boredom zone, but it puts them in, you know, it's like when a speaker does a great job, you listen to them speak for an hour and then afterward you're like, that was an hour. And that's because they gave you a wide variety of emotions to, and, and it creates a time warp. And so, yeah, make them laugh, make them cry, make them angry, make them sad, make them feel, and then also give them data that either answers existing questions they have or answers questions they didn't even know they had. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And, and so say if you've got a 45 minute presentation, how many peaks per minute do you strive for? It's a great question. It's a great question. Um, you know, we, we, uh, I always ask that question at, at the speaking academy, how many peaks per minute do you think it needs to be? And uh, I will tell you that my experience is that uh, if you can deliver consistent PPMs of one, that is a frequency of one peak per minute. If you can do that, you're, you can be a professional great speaker. You can make money. Like, 
And, and, and by the way, if you ever want to test this, go to a conference and check the PPMs yourself and you will find that the average conference speaker has a PPM so far sub one that it'll blow you away. They, they, they can have you, they can be speaking for half hour, 45 minutes, an hour and make you feel nothing. And by the way, even if they had a lot of good data points that might have registered for you, the trouble is without emotional response, the data points won't even register. Emotion ultimately is what triggers memory. And so if you don't have an emotional range, then the data points just get lost. And later on, somebody goes, hey, what did that speaker talk about? <laughs> I don't really remember. But I have people walk up to me in airports and go, oh my God, oh my God. Yeah, I remember that story you told about the time you were hunting with the Bushmen. They remember the details of it because I made them feel. Right. And so it, you know, the, a PPM of one will, it is, it is enough to get somebody professional. And if you can get PPMs upward of six or seven, you're going to be on late night TV. You're, you're ta if you can hold a PPM of six or seven, that's world-class comedy. That's world-class delivery. That's Jim Carrey. It's, it's Robin Williams. It's, it's PPMs of six or seven. But it's also really important to remember, the longer the talk, the harder it is to maintain that PPM frequency. And it's also not that you are hitting that PPM every single minute. It's a frequency. So it means in the course of a 60 minute talk, you need to have 60 peaks, but they don't all have to be one per minute. In fact, that would just be wrong. You'd have a cadence problem. Sometimes you'll hit five peaks in one minute and then that'll give you a few minutes to deliver really solid content. I don't know if you've ever watched Ken Robinson's uh, TED talk from 2006. It's the most watched TED talk in the history. No, of I have not and actually. He, it, it, his talk is clinically perfect. As somebody who teaches this stuff for, you know, I, it, it is clinically perfect. And you'll notice if you watch it, there's a point where he's hitting you with all these PPMs and it's awesome. But then there comes this point where he goes into lecture mode. He's a professor and he goes into lecture mode and he's just about to lose you and boom, he brings the peaks <laughs> back in. And so emotions earn the right to teach. And that's, yeah. So PPMs of one, that'll get you professional. Two or three, you're making money. Like you're, you're getting booked and six or seven, you're on TV. So that makes sense why all of the college professors out there, not all of them, but so many of them, <laughs> that's why we forget our studies, right? <laughs> Think about this. It's really interesting. I've asked audiences this question all over the world. It's really, it's so interesting. I ask how many of you have a teacher that to this day, you remember their name, their voice, and you remember some of the stories they told. And everybody's got one or two. And 80% of the teachers they remember were history teachers. Okay. Telling stories. Because history teachers tell stories. And every now and again, it was another subject, but it's because that teacher understood telling stories. My grade three teacher, Jan uh, Kolchinski, Mr. K, we called him, because when you were nine years old in Canada, you didn't know how to say <laughs> Kolchinski. And uh, he, he walked into class one day and he goes, we're going to be doing health class today. And like, we're nine. Health class doesn't get interesting until you're 12. Like, we don't even want to be here. It's going to be the most boring class ever. But he was a phenomenal storyteller. Now, this is 1977. And I can tell you that some big things happened in 1977. Elvis died. Most of us at seven years old didn't know. But Star Wars was released, right? It was 1970. He walks into the class and he draws a line down the board and he starts saying, he's like, all right, now there are these evil people, these evil empires. And he starts drawing, I kid you not, TIE fighters on the board, well drawn. And then he goes to the other side and he goes, but then you've got the Rebel Alliance. These guys are called antibodies. And he drew X-wing fighters on that side of the board. And he did this whole story about how the evil viruses and pathogens, bacteria are coming in this way. And then the, e and then the antibodies and the immune system is fine. I was nine and I still remember the lesson word for word, I, the drawings that he drew on the board because he told a story that was a frequency match for who we were. And that's what great teachers do. I, this is an unpopular thing I'm about to say, and I probably get in trouble sometimes saying it, but I don't totally believe in ADHD. I, I, I know it exists, I get it, but I often think that, that like, you know, attention deficit disorder is actually boring teacher syndrome. <laughs> yeah, it's And true. that is not the, I don't wanna blame any one teacher for that. It's the way we teach our teachers. And, and when a teacher really becomes committed to getting the lesson in, then they have to remember, in order for, for, in order for children to, to remember, they need to feel. And in order for the audience to feel, the speaker needs to feel. That's amazing. Okay, when are you gonna have a course come out about public speaking? Because that was really good. <laughs> we, could, we could talk the whole podcast about that. That's... I got two of them coming up in June. They're sold out and canceled because they were in Oslo and apparently we're not going oh, to Oslo. No, uh, so they've been postponed off to the fall. 
we are doing an online uh, program called the One Talk Workshop, which is a um, funny story that I'm working on this book called One Talk Away, and it's based on the premise or the idea that everybody on earth is one well-constructed, one well-delivered talk away from whatever massive breakthrough that they're looking for. Best-selling book deal, movie deal, raising money for their company, political campaign, even, even the Obamas will tell you that sitting in the White House over dinner, they would often refer back to this one talk that Barack did when he was a congressman, and they feel it was that one talk that created the entire platform him become wow. president. And so that's the basis of this book is that everybody in the book explains why you're one talk away and then how to build that talk. Well, when the pandemic hit and all of a sudden our horror live event business fell apart, I took a look and said, all right, what can we do to still serve people? And we took our launch campaign for the book and brought it forward to now. We had a webinar coming up about public speaking. And so we converted the program to an online program for speech design. So we have a three day program where we teach people and it immediately sold out, which proved to us there still is an economy during lockdown. Absolutely, absolutely. Any thoughts on when the book may come out? Uh, you know, we're rejigging all, we have two books that are in schedule right now, and we're rejigging both of them because of the lockdown. And what I mean by that is one of them, the book is called Post Diabetic. And it's a book that I've co-written with one of our Wild Fit coaches, who's a medical doctor. What a neat story. He was, uh, wow, what a neat guy. He's got three clinics in Southern California, and he was 35 pounds overweight, hypertensive, and type two diabetic, and a doctor, and on five medications. And then he stopped off at, I don't know, some coffee place with a green logo, and he pulled in and grabbed himself a vente coffee to keep himself awake for the drive to work. Even with that coffee in his bloodstream, he passed out at the wheel, fell asleep, got in a horrible car accident. Luckily, nobody was hurt. Three days later, he's in the rental car, because his car's totaled, driving to work, buys another coffee to keep himself awake on the drive, falls asleep again behind the wheel. Again, luckily nobody's hurt, but he begins to realize there's a major problem. And frankly, what right does he have to be a dog? Right. That night, like you, he bumped into one of my YouTube commercials published by Mind Valley, and he ended up going to one of our master classes. Three months later, 35 pounds down, no longer hypertensive, type 2 diabetes reversed, which means he's no longer diabetic, he's post diabetic. And, um, and his life was changed. And so he contacted me and we're, we've now written this book called post diabetes that makes the argument that, that diabetes is of course reversible, tells people how to reverse it, but it also makes another really important argument that we really want to get out there. And that is we don't regard diabetes. And by the way, if this seems a little off topic, I want you to think about this and I'm sure you're starting to see this. Six weeks ago, I uploaded a video saying, if you want to protect yourself against COVID, yes, you should do your social distancing, but you should really eat well. If you really want to protect yourself against COVID, six weeks, I said that course, what's the science told us in the six weeks following? It's all about food. 90% of the people dying and being seriously hospitalized have food related diseases and lifestyle related diseases. So anyway, like long answer to your short question is that we were going to go with a standard publisher, but that would take 14 months to two years to get the book onto shelves. And we aren't willing to wait that long with what's going on. So we're going to self publish it. And that moves the schedule of the one talk away book. So I'll let you know when it happens, but we're working on it now. <laughs> please, please, please. We'll share. Um, well, that kind of, that's a good leeway into your story because, you know, we've talked about public speaking, a little bit about COVID, a little bit about your book that's coming out. But the real reason I wanted to bring you on is because of the main business that you've built, WildFit. And I love the concept behind it, actually, what you've built it into, and then how you've gained this influence um, through the business and through your reputation and through speaking, I'm sure as well to create a successful business. So we're interviewing a hundred major influencers right now talking about the, the power of influence and how they use that to help people and how to use it responsibly. But I'd like to talk, uh, start off Eric, just talking about your story. Cause you have a, a fascinating background. Um, we've had some other people in the health industry with a, a similar start as you, they started out sick and they couldn't figure out why they couldn't get well when, and they were doing all the all the things that the doctors told them, and I might just give you the mic for a couple minutes, and you can just uh, elaborate on um, how everything started for you because I think it's fascinating, especially at such a young age, how you started to make mental shifts around traditional medicine versus diet. So I am. Um, I grew up in kind of an interesting. We were immigrants, and I had a lot of doctors in my family, and then um, and then I went through some of the normal childhood stuff, alcoholism, divorce, and all that kind of stuff. And one of the things that that created in me is uh, a real sense of independence. Like my, I, I figured out pretty young if I was going to make it, it was up to me. And um, 
And that said, what happened for me is that I, uh, I was consistently ill in my, in my late te- mid to late teens. And um, what I mean by that is that I, I suffered with chronic throat infections, chronic sinus infections, ear infections, digestive problems, headaches, and cystic acne. And they just, they were things that um, I didn't even think of them as illness. I just thought of them as my way of being. I, I've read since in psychological uh, studies that children who are in chronic pain find a way to delete the pain. And so they don't really consciously feel the pain, but it will do things like interrupt their sleep and that kind of stuff. And I was kind of in that place where I didn't think of myself as a sick person. I just, this is who I was. And finally, one of my doctors uh, recommended that I, well, not recommended, demanded that I take my tonsils, get my tonsils taken out of my throat. And at that stage, I was already becoming quite an independent thinker. And something bothered me about that. Like, I, I just... There was something about the whole like Darwinian process of evolution and like they're there for a reason, you know, like I, I, it just irritated me that we would be taking them out, but I was in so much pain. They were bleeding. They were golf ball size. I mean, in the end he had a clipboard and a stethoscope and a white coat. So, you know, I'm going to listen. And then I sat down with some friends of mine and uh, they introduced me to Tony Robbins, funny enough. And uh, one conversation about food led to another and, you know, they all kind of challenged me to just make some changes for 30 days. Not that I was unhealthy, not, not that I ate badly. I ate fairly normally. I mean, we had pizza every now and again, a little bit of fast food from time to time, but I, I wasn't like bad, I thought. And 30 days later, I was so transformed that it w- I would never look back. I lost 35 pounds. Um, incidentally, I weigh more now than I did then before losing the weight, but it was a different kind of 35 pounds, right? And my face changed completely. What I mean is, first of all, the cystic acne cleared up, but also the sinus infections were causing, you'll often see in people that are a little bit overweight that they're not just overweight, that they actually have puffiness here. And that's because they have chronic sinus infections from dairy products and other things that trigger those things. And so I, I, and and all of my symptoms went away and I was done. And that's, that's the beginning of like massive curiosity for me. I was irritated. I had spent almost a decade visiting doctors and specialists being prescribed pills, creams, inhalants, and injections, and finally surgery, and none of them helped except for a few hours. And all of a sudden, 30 days of food, and I'm like, what? Why did not one of them say that to me? Not even the doctors in my own family. In fact, I sat down with my uncle at one point, orthopedic surgeon, so what, 12 years of medical school? And I said to him, uh, I said, listen, in all the years you spent in medical school, can you tell me something? How much of that time did you spend studying food? None, not five minutes. I mean, yeah, they talked about food relative to surgery. You know, don't let your, you can't have a full stop. Like that's it. And now I've asked that question of doctors in over 20 countries around the world. And every now and again, a doctor will say, yeah, I did. I studied some food. And then I'll follow up with, but it was elective, right? And yes, it was elective. It's not even remotely required to study food to become a doctor. And that is a problem. And by the way, this may sound anti-doctor, not at all. I, I, when I was 18 years old, somebody lit me on fire and I had to have my arm rebuilt with skin from my legs. Thank God there was a surgeon. Uh, six weeks ago, I was deep in the middle of Africa, visiting the Hadza Bushmen, hunting and gathering in the middle of everything. And in the middle of it, I developed appendicitis and my appendix had to be emergency removed. It had ruptured. Wow. Thank God there was a doctor. I'm not down on doctors. I'm down on a medical education that doesn't educate them about food. Yeah. Yeah. It makes complete sense. And, and you, this was at 14, right? That you started questioning all this. No, that was at 21. 21. 21. Okay, got it. And then, um, you know, I, I, luckily for me, uh, I also had a real fascination with um, evolutionary biology and, and, um, and human history because my great-grandfather had discovered the oldest homo sapien skull in history at that oh, wow. time, which was 259,000 years old. And I'd even been at the museum where, you know, they, they do all the research and I'd held a cast of it in my hand. And I remember thinking at 12, I remember even at 12 thinking, what was his life like? Like really, what was life like back then? And he had these bite marks in the skull. We don't know if they're cause of death or after death, but they're about the size of a leopard or hyena bite marks. And it's like, how did he die? What what, what was his life like? What did he eat? And I suddenly was like, what did he eat? Wait a second. And you know what you said in the interview, in in the introduction? You said, oh, diet might be a bad word. No, it's not a bad word. It's an incorrectly used word. Okay. Diet's a fabulous word. Just listen to David Attenborough on a diet, on a, on a, on a, you know, listen to any of the nature programs, listen to any of them. And they'll use the word diet correctly every single time. Look, the lion has a diet. 
of wildebeest and zebra and occasionally elephant and other animals. The cheetah has a diet of 2.5 kilograms of fresh, only fresh. The lion will eat old meat. The cheetah will not. That's its diet. The leaf cutter ant has a diet and it, oddly doesn't involve eating leaves. <laughs> and, and so, you know, the, the fact is the word diet means lifestyle and every organism on earth has a naturally evolved diet, a naturally evolved ability to procure and process food and a naturally evolved set of nutritional requirements. And that is their diet. We go on diets and we use the word incorrectly. We've now changed the meaning of the word and diet now means temporary alteration to your normal behaviors in order to achieve a short-term result like a certain outfit you want to wear on the beach. Right. That's a diet. And so what I realized that day when I started really dig digging into this is that every organism on earth has a diet and therefore sapiens must too. And that's not a mystery. We know what our ancestors ate. We know how they lived. It's, there are some mysteries about it, but generally not. And that, so now I had this health renaissance. Then I bumped into this whole like, holy crap, humans, anthrop anthropology, human evolution. And then one more thing that came in for me. And that was, I became absolutely fascinated about what drove human behavior, like why people did what they did and wouldn't stop doing what they didn't want to do and wouldn't start doing the stuff they did want to do. And I studied everything I could about that. And about six years ago, I got frustrated because people would come to me and go, Eric, I need to lose this weight, or I want to turn around my diabetes, or I want to get my sex drive back, or I want to create fertility where I can't seem to get pregnant. Like, I want to fix my body. And I would go, no problem. Eat this stuff here. Leave some of these things out for now. That's your recipe for success. And you know, Chris, they wouldn't do it. Yeah. Like they, they wouldn't do it. They do it for a day or two and then they'd stop. And then I realized that I'm no, if I do it that way, I'm no different than the diet industry. The diet industry is predicated upon removing your freedom and nobody wants their freedom removed. They will rebel against any set of rules. What I was going to have to do is figure out a different way. And so we, what we did is we figured out food psychology and, and, and behavioral change psychology and combined it with nutrition and everything's been hit. I mean, we took eight people through the program six years ago and, um, it was mind blowing. Like all eight of them changed their behaviors, all eight. And then of course that was before we even started refining the program. We then took another eight and another eight. And then they started telling their friends and they started telling their friends. And then one day Vishen Lakiani from Mind Valley did it. And he told his list and he published pictures of his body before and after. And he was a fairly fit guy, yeah. but the improvement was so wholesale that our business just exploded. We've now served over 20,000 people in 130 countries around the world. And every single, just yesterday, I got this message. Woman had um, thyroid cancer 30 years ago and had to have a series of different chemotherapies to do that. It caused a long-term problem with her esophagus, wherein her esophagus is constantly shrinking as a result of fibroids of some kind. And so she has to have her esophagus stretched about every six months. And when she doesn't get it stretched, she starts losing her capacity to swallow. And they told her that eventually stretching wouldn't work and she'd have to switch to a feeding tube and that would be the rest of her life. And she wrote to us yesterday because during COVID, she was a little concerned about how she was going to be able to get to the clinic for her stretching appointment. And then suddenly she realized she'd already missed the regular date for it. And the reason she'd missed the regular date for it is she was having no difficulty swallowing. That her esophagus had done the thing that all the doctors and surgeons and everybody else told her that it couldn't do. It had healed. Wow. And that, that just, that, I get letters like that every single day, type two diabetes reversal, pregnancies where they've been trying for five years with every intervention method possible, and then they've given up, and then they've reformed their relationship with food, and boom, there it is. And it fills me with joy every day. It's incredible, incredible. What, what are we missing? You know, uh, let's say, okay, we know processed food, uh, we know factory farm meat, um, we know, you know, junk food, of course. What, what's, I mean, when we know sugar, refined sugar, what are, other than that, like, what are we really missing that is, is the best form for a human diet? Most people are overfed and starving to death at the same time. Oh, really? Most people are eating too much energy and not enough non-energy nutrients. That's what's going on for most okay. people. And so they're overfed and malnourished all at the same time. And, and, and so what happens when we are malnourished is that we become much more susceptible to injury, uh, inability to heal, much more susceptible to disease pathogens, and also just internally created diseases. And, um, and so what's missing is, uh, you know, getting enough of the good stuff. One of the principles, we have a number of wild fit principles. One of the principles is that your health is far more dependent upon you getting enough of the good stuff 
than it is you eliminating the bad stuff. And every other diet is kind of on this like, eliminate these seven things and take out this and this one vegetable will solve everything. And while some of those things are based on truths, they're not sustainable. Um, what is far more important about our diet is getting enough of the good stuff. So what is the good stuff? Well, the good stuff is, let's look at what our ancestors have always eaten. You know, I'm not talking about Egyptians. That's not even ancient. You know, we think of the, the Ayurveda, it's ancient. It's not ancient. I'll, I'll tell you ancient. I, I grew up in Eastern Canada. If you were in an old house in Eastern Canada, it was 180 years old. That's an old right. house. If you're in California, an old house is 45 years old. If you're in England, an old house is 300 years old. If you're in Croatia, an old house is six or 700 years old. If you're in Egypt, an old house is 3,500 years old. If you are on the Southern coast of South Africa and you go into any of the caves that my great grandfather excavated, you will find caves where humans have been living in them until modern times consistently for 200,000 wow. years. That's old. That's an old house. And you know what's really fascinating about that is that when people live in caves like that, they eat and throw shoulder, throw the food, they just drop the food, <laughs> and you get what's called litter. Uh -huh. And the litter just grows as the floor grows. They just pack it down and pack it down and pack it down and pack it down. And so over the space of 200,000 years, the, the cave floor grows, say, 20 feet or something. And then what they did is they took careful archaeological processes and cut through the floor and put a glass wall up and you can literally see specifically what people have been eating for 200,000 years. It is not a mystery. It's not something open for debate. I don't care what like the latest science says this thing here tweaks this about. That's hacking. That's a different issue. The baseline of all biohacking is make sure the biology is correct in the first place. And there it is. People have been eating what we've been eating. What have we been eating? Seasonally flowing and seasonally available fruits and vegetables and an incredibly wide variety of them, upwards of 200 species a year. And of course, seasonally available meats, fishes, eggs, some seeds, some nuts. That's it. Honey. That's pretty much it. Wow. Anything else that we eat is irrelevant. Anything else, and not just irrelevant, unnecessary is a better word because it's not irrelevant. If you put something unnecessary in your body, you have to use body energy to process that unnecessary thing. And you're using energy that you might otherwise be using to power your immune system or your healing. Or, you know, so when you stick some weird ass preservative in your body, your body's like, oh man, more junk to get rid of. <laughs> and then sometimes it squeezes that junk out through your skin and you call it a, an infection or it squeezes it out through your breath or it squeezes it out by making you vomit. But, you know, you're, when we put stuff in, it's got to come out if we can't use it. If we can use it, it's great. You know, when somebody goes into a meat eating season, what they notice is all of a sudden, they don't, they don't, they don't got to poop as much. You know why? Because you use most of what you <laughs> ate. When you switch to a plant season, you end up actually pooping a lot more because there's a lot more cellulose and unusable things in the plant. I'm not saying they're bad. They're just, you, you don't break them down and turn them, so you get rid of them. Well, when you eat garbage junk food, your body works so hard to try to get rid of it. You try and pee it out. You try and poop it out. It comes out through your skin. It comes out through infections. You know, it's bad. So it's a combination of getting enough of the good stuff in, which, Chris, the great news is when somebody really does that, their cravings for the bad stuff often gets diminished anyway. Mm, I love that. So uh, I got a couple of questions just based on, um, based on this conversation here. One is, is my thoughts in it, and I'm sure it's going to differ, but like um, seasons are different in tropical areas compared to North America or South America, right? And so yeah. does that mean humans in tropical areas have different foods that they need? They have a different human diet? No, um, the, the clock, you know, you, you, you might not know this. Are you, you live in a, you live in America, you live Austin in the US, right now, yeah. Right? You're yeah. In Austin. So what you don't realize is that you're an African American. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now I, I'm kidding. And that's a politically sensitive thing. And if you clip that one thing out, the whole world will probably hate me. So don't do that. <laughs> but, but here, the deal is, is that you evolved in Africa and looking at you, you stopped off in Scandinavia for a little while, you True. know, you stopped off in Northern Europe and then you ended up in America. Does that sound yeah, about 100%, right? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I, I also evolved in Africa. Then I stopped off in the South of France for a little while. And I picked up a little, you know, the Mediterranean look. So the, the pace of evolution, is such that to change the uh, food producing capabilities of a species and to change its nutritional requirements, which is another whole thing, um, of a species with an evolutionary velocity of ours takes hundreds of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and, and, and so we 
were in Africa until fairly recently. And so as we've moved out, we've encountered all kinds of problems. And, and that's because we've encountered foods that we don't really have a relationship with. I would even put to you that one of the reasons, and this is a contentious theory and I don't have a bunch of science to back it up, but I would put to you that one of the reasons that, um, uh, that the uh, North and South American natives were so devastated by Europeans when they arrived, were so devastated by, say, you know, uh, smallpox, alcohol, sugar, and all the other stuff that hit them so very hard, is that their immune systems were already badly compromised by eating American plants for multi-generations and not yet being ready to eat them properly. You know, it, we're not good at eating potatoes. We're not good at eating corn. We're not good at eating nightshade plants. And, and so if you and I suddenly got on a spaceship and went to, you know, whatever, Alpha Centauri, and it turns out that there were planets there that had plants on them, would you just randomly start eating those plants? I mean, the odds of any of them, A, not being poisonous for you, B, being good for you, unlikely. And so it's, it, you know, that, that's really, that's, so, so when I talk about the seasons, I don't really care what the seasons are in Austin. I don't care what the seasons are in Minnetonka. I care what the seasons are where your DNA is from. Think of it this way. You built the Jeep in one place, okay, you take it to another place, you might need snow tires. So you might need to make some cosmetic differences. Like you live in a place that's cold now, you're gonna have to have clothing in Africa, you might not have needed that. But you're, at, your, at your core, your nutritional requirements are the same. Now I know there's all this like blood type diet and genome diet, but you know what you'll find? Honestly, you look at any of them. I've done my genome and it turns out that I'm sensitive to, you fill in the blanks. What are people sensitive to? When they go get their genome diet test, what are they sensitive to? Dairy products, wheat, sometimes strawberries, sometimes meat, I don't really understand. But I mean, there's a list of things. Oh, nightshade, nightshade plants. Well, they're sensitive to the things that don't belong in the human diet. Some people are more sensitive to them and some people are less sensitive to them. And I would put to you that the people that are less sensitive to them are the unlucky ones. You see, if you're not gluten intolerant, then you'll be tempted to eat more bread than you should. Slam your system with sugar, screw up your pancreas, and move yourself toward insulin sensitivity problems. Not to mention other potential long-term issues like, for example, irritable bowel syndrome and messing up your digestion by putting grains in there. Now, if you're gluten intolerant, you eat it, it makes you feel pain, you stop eating it, which is kind of a good thing. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so, so all of our diets are based on our ancestors coming out of Central Africa, more or less? That's what I believe. I, 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 I will tell you that there are differences, but they're very, in my opinion, the differences are only at the level of symptomal reaction. And then there are different body types relative to metabolism. Some people you know, burn their food more quickly than others. And I think that society always had people that were geared for different roles. Some people were meant to be faster. Some people were meant to be stronger. Some people were meant to do different tasks. And maybe as a result of that, there are some metabolistic differences. But go find me somebody who doesn't need vitamin C or D or, amino, or all 20 amino acids. Go find one human. One, I don't care if they're in, in Osaka or in, in Zululand or I don't care where they are, they need all those same things. And they're good at processing all the same foods. And, and so, no, I don't, I don't believe that you need to worry too much about what, it's not about eating locally, it's about eating what your species wants. You know, if you take an African elephant and you breed it for 10 years in America, it's still an African elephant. Breed it for 100 years, it's still an African elephant. It still needs to eat what an African elephant eats. It's a good point, that makes sense. Um, so what's your diet look like? on a daily basis? There's a great example. We want to think in daily basis because the diet industry has taught us a bunch of absolutely pointless and frankly dangerous ideas. One is that there is something you should be doing on a daily basis. The only thing you should be doing on a daily basis, the only things you should really be doing on a daily basis are air, <laughs> water, and movement. But there's no particular food that you should be having on any kind of a daily basis because our bodies evolve for seasonal rotation. Right, and so okay. my, my, you know, the way I'd put it to you is this, that currently um, we have fruit in season here. There's mangoes that are in season and papayas are in season. So I'm eating those things. I enjoy it. There's all these people out there like, oh, fructose is evil. And all right, I don't care. Like 5 million years of eating fructose and we're still the dominant species on the planet. I don't see the problem. You know, if we started eating in the last five minutes, I'd understand, but no. But where those people are right, and many of them are my very good friends that say stuff like that, they're actually more right than they're wrong. They're still wrong, in my opinion, but they're more right than they're wrong because people never had access to fruit year round. Fruit was seasonal. 
It was something that was available for a few days and then it was gone. And so when I say they're more right than they're wrong, they're right. We should not be eating fructose 365 days of the year. We should probably be eating it like 20 or 30 days of the year or maybe 60 with different cycles of different fruits across the year. So my diet is taking a look at, I, I concentrate my efforts in, at the highest level, I concentrate my efforts on the best quality and best availability meats, fishes, poultry, eggs that I can get, and the best quality and widest variety of vegetables that I can get, and seasonal fruits from time to time, sometimes some honey, sometimes some seasoned nuts. Then, a couple of other principles I like to follow. I like mono meals as best possible. I don't like mixing my food. I, I, I you know. I don't think, I, just six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, before the lockdown, I was in Tanzania doing one of my regular visits with the Hadza Bushmen of East Africa. I've been visiting them now for 10 years. These are proper hunter-gatherer Bushmen. They don't have money. They don't have agriculture. They, they, they hunt and gather. They move with the water and with the game. And, and what, you know what I've noticed is that when we go hunting and we kill a big bush pig, you know what they don't do? Anybody got potatoes? Who's got the potatoes? <laughs> like they don't go looking for something else. They eat what they've got in front of them. And you know what? The next day when we're out hunting and we stumble upon a bush and it has the right root vegetables, which it's, it's one plant. Oh my God, it's delicious. It's like the mix between like red onions and sweet potatoes in one, in one plant. You can eat them raw, which is by, by the way, a good clue of whether something is edible or not. If you cannot eat it raw, it's not edible. You can make it edible by cooking it, cooking it but I would make that a questionable edible. Whereas if you can just eat it raw, it's clearly edible. And these ones, you can eat them raw or cook. Cook, they're better because they caramelize. But you know what's really funny, Chris? When right. we find them and we dig a bunch of them up, we carry them back to camp. And nobody goes, hey, we got to get a pig with this. We got to get some. No, <laughs> they, they eat that thing. And my belief about that is, is that our bodies develop the, the, you know, we both breed the right gut bacteria fast, by the way. Bacteria breeds on, life, on time scales that we don't even think about. You know, like within days, your gut bacteria can change. And so when we start eating that vegetable, our body starts optimizing its gut bacteria for that particular food. It starts optimizing the fluids it produces. When we eat starchy stuff, we produce different digestive fluids than when we eat meat. And so I think it's ideal that we eat them in mono meals, that we, that we focus as best possible on singular ingredients at a given meal. And that we run seasonality, that we don't ever allow ourselves to get onto a place where we're, where we're messing with our pancreas every single day for multiple days in a row. It makes sense. Um, I have to ask, Eric, are those African Bushmen living healthy lives? Do, you, do they have, you know, are they lacking cancer? Are they lacking those diseases that we have? Are they living longer lives? They, you know, it's becoming more difficult because there are um, missionaries that visit them and are destroying them. And so it's becoming more difficult. But no, traditionally, you can look at any of those types of Hadza, the Kung, uh, you know, if, if you look in, uh, you know, in any of those sort of traditional cultures, they don't, they don't have cancer, they don't, they don't have heart disease, um, they don't factor anywhere in the top 100. In fact, if you really want to go there, America, cancer and heart disease weren't in the top 10. They weren't even in the top 10 100 years ago. Really? I didn't no, know that. No, oh, wow. they, now they're number one, two, and three, you know, yeah. like you're, you're talking about fully one third of Americans will succumb to cancer and one third of Americans will die from heart disease. And what they don't realize is that they should be filing a class action lawsuit against the food industry because that never existed a hundred years ago. It's, and then some people will come along and go, yeah, but it's because everybody's living older. I don't think so. I understand that living older obviously creates a little bit more inclination toward that stuff. But the, the, the real issue is, is that most people are overeating calories, messing up their pancreas, creating blood sugar problems, aging their insides, and then they're under eating really vital nutrients that their body needs to fight stuff. And as a consequence, they're experiencing disease. The Hadza, they die of things like falling out of trees, wild animals, fighting with other tribes. Those are their main common cause of death. And by the way, everybody will come back and go, yeah, but they didn't live very long. Okay, listen, you know, you can lie with statistics. Uh, people are lying with statistics all the time. I, I am always one. Like, you know, I don't know if you've seen these two doctors that are talking about the, the flattening the curve and all this kind of stuff. And, and they're, they're against the lockdown. And, and I have done a lot of analysis about this. And what I would say to you is I mostly agree with them. But one thing I have to think about is that they own private care clinics that are, that are, that are suffering in the lockdown, which tells me that they're not objective. Now, it doesn't mean they're wrong but I'm always looking at that kind of stuff, right? And so yeah. when people say the Bushmen don't live that long or you know, traditional Africans didn't live that long, they almost always have an agenda. They're trying to prove some other point, but here's what you need to know. With an 80% infant mortality, if any of, if, then you have to take a look and go, well, say, hey, if their average age is 35 and they have an 80% infant mortality, do the math on how old they must really be living. Yeah. See? 
You see, it's yeah. just that when you, when you have an 80%, if you have a bunch of children that die before their fifth birthday, then that averages the age down dramatically. I have been with the Huds. I've seen members of their tribe that are in their 60s. Now, I'm not going to suggest they live much further than their 60s, but we don't live much further than their 70s. So it's not that big a difference, in my opinion. And I've never seen any of them walking with a limp. I've never seen any of them with arthritis. I've never seen any of them. I've just never seen that. Now, I've also until recently, never seen obesity. I did recently see an obese Bushman. It broke my heart. Why? Well, because missionaries come along and they want to spread the word of some or other ghost that they think that that particular tribe should be following. And so while they're there, they give them food. And you know what they give them? Corn meal and wheat meal. So they're basically giving them sugar and this poor woman and then went to go live with the missionaries for some time. And now she's no kidding, 80 pounds overweight. A Bushman, 80 pounds overweight. Guess what? She's going to be diabetic and she's going to die. And they've got maybe one generation left before the missionaries and the government ends their way of life by forcing them into, into our way of life. It's, it's sad. I hear you, man. So let's talk about this. Like I, I want to talk a little bit about the business and influence, um, but uh, I want to touch on some things right now that, that people could do like any, any suggestions you have, a lot of people are quarantined, but right now they're loosening those up, right? Yeah. What are, what are some suggestions from you, Eric, on living a healthy lifestyle, maybe creating new habits right now, um, making sure you're not eating too much cake and, and popcorn and pizza right now. Um, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, one thought I have for you is, you know, there's all kinds of interesting research been done about what creates habits and, and um, you know, like how many days it takes to create a habit. And it's anywhere from six to 68 days. But generally, I arrive between the 15 and 21 day mark for daily activities. When, when science says that it can take 68 days, I think they're talking about weekly activities. So anything you do on a daily basis for 15 to 21 days is likely going to become a habit. This is an important thing to think about during lockdown. The other thing is, is that we have to look at what causes habits to happen. And one of the things that have causes habits to happen is that survival used to be incredibly unlikely. Um, it was a very unlikely, if you really think about how unlikely you are as a human being, first of all, your father produced 300 million sperm and only one of them got through. The odds of you being are about the same as the odds of you becoming president. That's how unlikely you are. And your parents were as unlikely as that as well. And so was the last generation. But then add to another level that four or five generations before that, we had 80% infant mortality or 50% infant mortality and then 80 before that. In other words, surviving used to be really tough. People face death on a daily basis. And today we don't. We live in the safe, even with COVID-19, we live in the safest times in the history of earth. But we have this old instinct. And the instinct is, if I'm alive on Tuesday, whatever I did on Monday must have been good. Let's do it again. And so that, that's partly where habits get created is your subconscious says, oh, I'm still alive and I've been doing the same activity for 15 days. I better keep it. And so your body creates a biochemical addiction to that feeling. And then it also creates, it rewrites your neural pathways. It actually builds circuitry. And the thicker that circuitry, get, that, that circuitry gets, the deeper the habit becomes part of your psyche, becomes part of your behavior. Why is this important? Well, there are people that have been doing stuff on lockdown that they don't want as habits, but they're going to have them. And so one question I think everybody should be asking before they do something, for example, as you said, before they eat some cake, they should be asking themselves, do I want to be a cake eater at the end of this? When they sit down and give their life away to Netflix, and don't get me wrong, uh, I'm there. I, I watch a little Netflix here and there. I'm not missing season three of Ozarks. But, <laughs> but, but, I, but, but the trouble is, is a lot of people are giving their lives to Netflix. And so the question is, do you want to watch Netflix this one time? time or do you want to become a Netflix addict? Do you, you know, and, 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 and so that's one of the questions we should be asking ourselves every time we undertake a behavior. Is this a behavior that we want as a habit? In lockdown, if you do it pretty much every day for two weeks, you're going to have a hell of a time stopping it when the lockdown's over, including bad food habits, TV watching habits, yelling at your children habits, whatever it might be. But the, the converse is, what if you did the, the opposite of that? And you said, well, what habits do I want at the end of the lockdown? And why don't I force with willpower those habits for 14 days or 21 days? And maybe I can acquire those habits as part of my life in the future. And I would say this too. We don't know what post-pandemic life is going to be like. It won't be like it was before. After 9-11 wasn't the same as before. And that was nothing compared to what we're facing at the moment. We don't know what it's going to be like. We know there's going to be economic upheaval. There's going to be industry upheaval. There's going to be civil liberty erosion. Like, we're going to face some differences. And here's what I know about that. I want to be healthy. 
I want to be mentally sharp. I want to be strong. I want to have skills and I want to be financially set. I want to be ready. So what do I want to use the lockdown for? Boot camp. I want to use lockdown as boot camp for what's next. And too many people are using lockdown as summer camp. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Okay, just uh, to touch on that, what are some things you're doing in, in your lockdown boot camp to, to keep on top of it? One of the things is I've been really clear about food. Like, I mean, I'm good at that anyway, but I've been really clear about food. I negotiated a deal with a local guy who does farm pickups and he drops off fresh stuff to me about once a week. I've negotiated a deal with the local uh, Dominican fisherman. He goes out and he gets me fresh tuna and fresh uh, mahi-mahi from, right from the sea. Um, so I've, I've really made sure that my, my food, my healthy eating is convenient to me. Uh, I also make sure that I'm outside every single day getting my vitamin D, getting my sunshine. And by the way, some of you might be going, but I live in England and I don't have any sun. If it's light outside, that's called sunlight. It doesn't have to be direct sunlight on your skin. <laughs> Good point. Be bright. Go outside yeah. and get that. Walk, work your cardiovascular system. Then also I've been investing in myself. I'm reading like crazy. I'm watching the right YouTube videos. I'm watching. I'm learning about what I need to be prepped for, for the world that's coming next. I, I have studied issues around what's going on with COVID so that I'm going to be prepared both as an individual person and as a father who cares about my children and as a community leader in the wildfit world to be able to help guide people through the post-pandemic but still COVID world. And then I've also taken a look and said, who do, I want, who do I want to be recreationally at the end of all this? And I thought, I have always wanted to play uh, the guitar, always. And I've just never gotten around to it. I'm always on planes. I always have an excuse. So I bought a guitar and I, five minutes a day. And you know what? I, I know six chords now. I never would have believed, I know them. Like I know them. Like I feel like a musician and five minutes a day. And so I'm, I am using the lockdown as boot camp, not summer camp. I love that, man. Excellent, excellent tips. Um, what are some ways, so, so moving into the business now, what are some ways that you guys are strategically either shifting or preparing yourself on the business side to make sure you're okay back in back end of COVID? We're Chris, very lucky. Um, we're very lucky for a number of things. One is that years ago I did the research to figure out what it took to create engaging content. I developed something called behavioral change dynamics for that, 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 to determine the way I put talks together and determine the way I put training programs together. And so our live events are among the highest rated live events in the industry. Um, you know, Mind Valley, for example, co-produces our five day speaking Academy and it's the highest rated live event they've ever produced consistently. We've done several of them. It has an NPS score. Uh, NPS is like a consumer rating system. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's a longer explanation, but the iPhone has an NPS score of 61 and the score is actually from minus 100 to plus 100. So 61 is a pretty amazing score. It means your clients are happy and they tell their friends about it all the time. We have a score in the 90s. Wow. And so, you know, what, 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 that's a major advantage for us because we switched our business online like starting six years ago. Okay. And so that means that as much as we still had a huge live event calendar, which was vaporized by the pandemic and the lockdown, our live event business existed already. Um, there are people right now signing up and doing the wild fit program because they want to get their relationship with food right. And our sales have not fallen from what they were before. In fact, I think where we've lost some sales to economic realities that people are facing, we've picked up some sales because people are going, holy crap, I got to change this. I, I need to boost my immune system. I need to be healthy. We also did some rejigging. I mentioned earlier that we had a webinar coming up to top up the sales of two of our live events. With two days to go to the webinar with 2,000 people registered, I called my team and I said, guys, there's no point trying to sell these live events. I don't think they're going to happen. At the time, my team thought that I was being shrill and hysterical because this was five weeks ago and they didn't think it was true. Within a few days, they were like, holy crap, you might be right. But we rejigged the webinar and decided to create an online version of the program, teaching people speech writing and speech delivering skills online. What's amazing about that is we didn't think anybody would buy anything with all the uncertainty. We, we offered 100 places so I can give a lot of personal attention. My team argued. They said, don't put a limit on it. We want to have, as we sold out in four days. We had a six-week marketing calendar. We sold out nice. in four days. Nice. So we put on a second one, and that one's almost sold out now too. And then the other thing that we did, so that's kind of A, what was existing, B, what we were modifying, and then C, what we're creating. One of the things that our clients have been asking us for a long time is to actually get into how we create our digital programs. Our WildFit program is the two years in a row by customer feedback, the highest rated program on the Mindvalley platform. And that's a pretty cool statistic. Mindvalley is an incredibly good publisher. I am up against serious authors for that, for that award. But the other thing is that 
none of the other programs on the Mind Valley platform are longer than 30 days. And the longer your program is, the harder it is to maintain engagement and high ratings. And it's a diet program. And diet programs never get good ratings because frankly, they don't work. So that tells you something if we've maintained that two years in a row. So our clients have been asking for us for a long time to break down what it is that we do to create courses that keep people engaged properly. We have an 85% completion rate on a three month pro digital program. It's pretty cool. And so we're, we, we decided what we're going to do is create that. So we are, we've now, we've now created that program and we're launching it. So for us, it's been a matter of luckily we were already online. B we took stuff that was real world and transferred it online. And C, we took a look at major gaps in the market and created the right online product to make that available for people. And one last thing about this. Some of these things are costing us quite a lot of money, and so it takes risk. But internet traffic is cheaper now than it's ever been because most people are responding in fear. So I don't know. Maybe it's the time to push forward and not pull back. But the other thing is, is that some of the stuff that we sell is literally life-saving for people. And so we've run a number of campaigns that have had like a name your own price component to them. We don't do that with the business stuff because that's business stuff and we're investing a lot of money. But with some of our wild fit campaigns, we've done that. And I think we all need to be prepared to give to our communities right now. Yes, we have to run businesses. We have employees to pay. They have rent to pay and mortgages to pay and food to eat. So we have to run our businesses and that's fine. But I think we also have to, we have to remember our tribes. We have to remember our clients. We have to make sure that we take care of them even if in that moment they can't afford what's going on. Well said, my friend. One more thing and we'll wrap up. Um, managing influence in a time like this, what are some things that you make sure that you and your team are doing so you're getting the right messaging out so um, things aren't contradictory, so that you know your tribe and your people are getting the right information? Um, as an influencer, what, how do you stay on top of that responsibility? You know, I, um, it's funny. I was never really interested in Instagram before three years ago two, or no, even like a year ago, I didn't even care. And then I started, you know, some of my friends had like a million, a million followers or a hundred thousand followers. I'm like, what the hell's going on? And, um, so I started looking at what I thought worked and what I thought didn't work. And I looked at my own social media use and my own influence use and all that kind of stuff. And I had quite an interesting experience with influence this year where for one of our companies, we found one of our students who was really eager to work with us and we partnered with him and he was able to do quite a lot of damage. And Andrea, the president of our company, she came to me later and she goes, Eric, I don't think you realize how much influence you've created over the last three years and you lent your influence to that guy. And he used your influence and hurt your brand. And she was dead right. He was, uh, he was toxic. There's no, no question about it. There was ethics issues and all that kind of stuff, but I, I had lent him my brand. So that's one of the things we've gotten clear about is really understanding that um, anything you do that violates your brand is basically going to create uncertainty for the market. And so you don't want to, you want to make sure that everything you do is filtered through your brand filter. So, you know, if I look at my highest level brand filter, I am about personal liberty, freedom, freedom from what you want to be free from and freedom to do what you want to do. I, I, that's my highest level brand filter for people, quality of life through personal liberty. And then, then there's Speaker Nation and that's, the, you know, the brand filter there is about how to help people develop super engaging and powerful talks and WildFit has its and so on. So then that, that brand filter makes it really easy because if we do hire somebody to do some social posting for us, they have to check that through the brand filter. Does it violate? You know, never, I mean, the, the colors and all that stuff, that's obvious, but I mean, does the message violate? And every now and again, it still happens, it, 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 but very rare. But for me personally, one thing I'm really clear about is I do not post to get followers. I don't post to get followers and I won't not post to not lose followers. And in fact, six, seven weeks ago, I posted a post called on Instagram, your last line of defense. I said, listen, social distancing is important. Wash your hands. All that stuff's really important. But why is not one doctor? Why is the CDC? Why is the WHO? Why are none of them telling you to stop eating sugar? Why are none of them telling you to eat properly? Why are none of them doing that? Because it, even the CDC on their own website says solving for malnutrition is more effective against a measles outbreak than the vaccine. They, that, they say that on their own website. Now, they're talking about severe malnutrition. I'm not talking about, you know, Detroit here. But, but the point being is, why was nobody saying that? I posted this on Instagram. It was my first net follower loss day ever on Instagram. <laughs> and you know what? I don't care. 
Right. Because my deal is I am here to provide value for my people. And my feeling is this, as long as what I'm doing is stimulating powerful, thoughtful conversation, I am not spreading fear. I have talked about the conspiracy theories. 5G, 5G, there are 30 countries with 5G and 190 countries with COVID-19. Debate done. So I go in and when I see this stuff going on, I'll wade into the conversation. But what I will not share is unsubstantiated garbage. What I will do is I will share theory and be clear it's a theory and stimulate conversation, it's good research, or I'll share facts or considered opinion. But I see so many of my friends destroying their credibility by posting 5G rumors that were created by a guy who still believes that the world is being run by shape-shifting you know, reptiles. Well put, my friend, very well put. All right, we're gonna wrap up there, Eric. I wanna thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing all your tips and tricks and wisdom with us. If the listeners wanna reach out and learn more about what you have going on, where's the best place they can do that at? Funny enough, I mean, on a personal basis, Instagram. I, I manage my own Instagram. Everything else has other people involved, but I, I answer questions directly when I can. I can't always, but I do my best. And so it's just my name, at Eric Edmeads. And of course, my website, which is www.eric.ee. Perfect, okay. Eric, thank you so much again for coming on the show. You guys, uh, thank you for turning, tuning in, and we'll see you all on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Hey, listeners. Thanks for joining us once again. We wanted to remind you about our high-performance productivity coaching and our five, six, seven, and eight-figure private masterminds. These are all designed for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs to help you scale rapidly and grow. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. That's thebusinessmethod.com. And we'll see you all on the next episode.